Greetings programs. This is Wretch, and welcome back to Shadowrun Returns. In the last episode, Dralgoth did some undercover work and was actually able to find the sample of Aegis that was needed to take care of these bugs for the Universal Brotherhood. Unfortunately, as he was making his way out, he found himself surrounded by Lone Star Security, led by our good friend McCluskey here, and decided to take us to the estate of James Telestrian III, the head of Telestrian Industries and I would assume one of the most powerful people in the Shadowrun universe. So we're here in front of the estate, and let's go ahead and talk to McCluskey and see what happens. McCluskey smirks. Want some advice, moron? Of course you don't. You're a Shadowrunner and you live by your own rules, don't you? I suggest you keep your smart-ass remarks to yourself this time. Mr. Delestrian isn't some street meat you can impress or intimidate. He's the brains behind the throne of Tear Dark... Uh, Tarngeyer. I still don't know how to pronounce that. I apologize. And he's one of the richest men in Seattle. Should I be impressed? His smirk gets even bigger. No. You go ahead in there and keep talking trash. That should work out fine for you, Drek for Brains. You got no money and you got no power. What do you got? Well, <laughs> honor. You're dumber than I thought. Enjoy your chat. I'll dispose of your body later. I really hope we get to put a sword in his skull. Okay, so we have Mr. Quoth. The fussy elf with the hair of, air of a Victorian butler studies you before he speaks. He doesn't like what he sees. Mr. Telestrian is expecting you. You will find him in his office. Oh, thank you, Jeeves. He is not amused. Delighted to be of service. You may wait here for a few moments to gather yourself before you enter Mr. Telestrian's office. Some people find that meeting him need time to prepare themselves before meeting an elf of his stature. However, the upstairs is off limits to you and the library is occupied at the moment. Do not tarry, though. Mr. Telestrian is not one to be kept waiting long. Hmm. Alright, then off he goes. Well, I guess let's do some, uh... Explore. Ooh, that's nice. That's kind of cool. Anything over here? No? We're gonna get our... Ooh, hello. Isn't... Algernon. Isn't he the, uh... Vendor from downstairs? There's a twinkle in Algernon's eyes that wasn't there when you spoke at the Seamstress's Union. It's good to see you again. There's much to do. What the hell are you doing here? I'm doing what I do, Dralgoth. Providing those in need with the tools they require. Seek me out after you've spoken to James Telestrian. Perhaps I can be of service again. But you've never actually been of service to me. I'm a street samurai. And we can't go upstairs right now. And the library, I guess, is off limits. Yeah, it's not even going to let me climb up there. Fair enough. Well, I guess we'll go talk to Boss Man. And you must be yeah, James Telestrian the Third. Nice office, though. Okay. Ooh. He looks formidable. As you approach, James Telestrian III looks up from the computer screen built into the surface of his desk and assesses you. Calculating and cold, a practiced smile comes to his face. He vibes the kind of rich you don't get from Trivid. He's not the clothing or the trappings or the bow before your betters mansion. It's something else, the feeling that you're being categorized as a resource or a liability or a pawn. I've been reviewing the results of your visit to my Seattle office last night. I admit, they are impressive. You have generated a considerable amount of damage to my office complex, killed or wounded many of my security personnel, and cost my vice president of security his job. In 24 hours, you have accumulated quite a bill with me, sir. How do you intend to settle your debt? Hmm. Well, I'll guess what? We're actually going to not try it. We're not going to be a uh, smart aleck to this guy. You already confiscated the container I took. I have no other bargaining chips. First, some instructions. You do not begin a negotiation by admitting that you have nothing of which to negotiate. 
However, you were considering your tactical situation. That tells me you are more than a mere street thug. Allow me to instruct you further. You have one piece of information which you might use as a bargaining chip in the little time you have left to live. Why you took what you took. I am interested to know why you and your team of criminals fought your way through my security teams up to my private office to access the Matrix and an uncovered location of a simple research project. Hmm. Oh. Okay, well, let's go ahead and just hit him with everything. Goes like this. Your half-brother Sam Watts hired me to find his own killer. He had a dead man switch. When I find the killer, I get paid. You impress me, sir. My father's bastards are intentionally not well known, even to themselves. Nevertheless, I fail to see the connection between this Sam Watts' death and a raid on one of my office buildings. There's no connection between the research project and the dead man that I'm aware of. Sam was killed by your half-sister Jessica. Jessica is protected by giant bugs. And he just kills giant bugs. Kill the bugs. Kill Jessica. Get paid. I find your bluntness somehow refreshing. He touches a button on the desk. Mr. Quoth, please ask my daughter to join us. The young, pretty elf has dark circles under her eyes and a haunted expression on her face. She recognizes you instantly. Oh, it's Marie. It's you! You're the man who helped me escape from the Universal Brotherhood. How did you get here? Delestrian cuts in quickly. Thank you, Marie-Louise. You have confirmed the identity of your rescuer and given me reason to forgive him for his trespasses against me. She looks hungry for your help. I'm glad you're here. Hmm. Well, you did well back there. Without you, we'd all be dead. She closes her eyes. Thank you, but I'm not sure the death would be, wouldn't be better than this. I can't sleep at all. I'm afraid that this is a dream and I'll wake up and still be there with, with the bugs. You can relax, Marie-Louise. You are safe. It's over. No! It won't be over until they're all dead! She shudders. You didn't see them. You, you don't understand. You and those men you flew in here. All you do is talk. It's just like you, for, you to form a committee, father. I knew that someone had to take action. That's why I got Harkim involved. The already cold exterior of James Telestrian III turns to ice. I see. It was you and your crippled little friend who leaked ages to this man. We'll speak of it later, in private. Now then, Drogoth, there are people I wish you to meet. The committee, my daughter alluded to. This is a rare opportunity for a man of the street such as yourself. I urge you to behave. We will adjourn to the library. Well, sounds like I don't have much of a choice. Not if you wish to draw another breath, no. So... This way to the library. There's a weight in Telestrian's library, a sense of magnitude and a purpose. You are no longer in the presence of mere wealth. You are in the presence of history. So, okay. One of our guys is here. I'm actually really surprised I haven't, I'm not seeing uh, Armitage. Lady and, lady and gentlemen, this is Dralgoth. He is the orc who saved my daughter and the only one who has faced our common enemy in combat. Herr Brachus, what's the representative of the great dragon, Lofweir, have to tell us about the magical insect this shadow runner uncovered? Brachus speaks slowly in a deep, uh, melodious, or I don't know how to say that. I, I, I've read it, I don't know how to pronounce it. German accent. He takes his time, accentuating each word, relishing each vowel and each consonant, tasting them as if they were a delicacy. My Lord Lofe has witnessed the ins insect spirit's physical manifestation before, roughly 9,000 years ago. As you are aware, magic ebbs and flows from the earth, cycling from peak to peak over the course of 5,200 years as the level of magic grows. Harlequin, Hans, dear, I love you, but you could babble on forever, and I believe time is of the essence. The painted elf addresses you. Jalgoth, is it? Delighted. The bug you fought was not merely a magical awakened animal like a wyvern or hydra or anything else in the sixth world. In fact, it isn't from this world at all. It's the physical embodiment of an insect spirit from another plane of existence. Hmm. Uh. Is that why I couldn't kill it? Exactly so. Your little buggy friend exists on both planes simultaneously. Now, an insect spirit can't simply thumb a ride through astral space and show up on Earth late for dinner. Dinner, in this case, being us. Two elements are required to bring one across the void, a shaman and a host. First, the spirit calls upon a shaman, often in dreams. 
The spirit seduces the shaman with promises of great power. The shaman then accepts the spirit as his totem. Next, the insect spirit requires a suitable host. The best candidates are the disaffected and the disenfranchised, in short, the weak-willed. Their minds are the most susceptible to suggestion, which is helpful in making the transformation. As you may imagine, there are the sort of people easily attracted to a cult, such as the Universal Brotherhood. Finally, by performing what has to be a truly disgusting ritual, the shaman serve the insect totem implants the spirit into the host, willingly or not. Then it's feeding time. Harlequin is correct. The insect spirit will then slowly consume its host while transforming it into the spirit's own insectoid body, thus manifesting itself fully on this plane. Hmm. Whiz. Bugs from another dimension need killing. I get it. No, you don't, kid. Not by a long shot. This is bigger than hunting down an insect shaman or putting a few 9mm rounds into a bug. The initial bugs prepare a nest for the summoning of a queen. Once a nest has its queen, she literally explodes with newly manifested insect spirits. They swarm out of the nest, feasting on all the flesh they can find and implanting more insect spirits into the fresh corpses. Again, and again, and again. The room falls silent as they consider the scenario. Face is grim. Telestrian breaks the silence. This is not an infestation, Drogoth. It is an invasion. My lord Lafuyer knew this day would come, but he did not know precisely when nor where. Your rescue of Mr. Telestrian's daughter has exposed the existence of an insect spirit for the first time in this cycle of the world. Hmm. So you're early to the party this time. That gives you the upper hand, right? We are not early. We merely have experience on our side. The insect spirit is only a resident in the transformed host's body. Conventional weapons can hurt the body and expose the spirit, but the spirit itself cannot be destroyed by mundane means. Hence, Project Aegis. Herr Telestrian's biotechnology and agricultural divisions worked with my lord Lafuyer's thaumaturgical engineers and designed Project Aegis to destroy an insect spirit once it is released from its host. The formula, a fluorescing astral bacteria strain, exists in the physical and astral plane at once and can thus affect the insect spirit. Now that was a mouthful. Did you memorize it or are you reading it off of index cards? My director of R&D, Diane Ravenwood, will explain now how Project Aegis will be used in the field. Dr. Ravenwood. Oh, hello. Our weapons specialists have rapidly prototyped a delivery device for the fluorescing astral bacteria strain. They've created some prototype launchers which fire Aegis-filled shells. When fired, the shells will discharge a high-velocity stream of the bacteria. In order to destroy one of the bugs, it must first be damaged using conventional weapons or magic until the spirit is released from the host body. Then the insect spirit must be shot with the Project Aegis prototype launcher to destroy it. Okay. Huh, it, stumps, it stomps bugs dead. Got it. Crudely put, but accurate. We must stop the Universal Brotherhood from summoning a queen, and we must stop them immediately. You are the only one who has been inside their facility, and the only one who has personally fought these creatures before. That, along with your highly effective assault upon my property, indicates that you are the ideal person to lead the attack. Hmm. Well, what makes you think project, this Project Aegis will actually work? He grins and his red lipstick catches the light. Oh, it's a male. Because it has to. Come on, kid. When fate taps you on the shoulder, you've got to pay attention. Unfortunately, she has the nasty habit of tapping you on the opposite shoulder so that you turn around she's on your other side, giggling like a deranged schoolgirl. I hate that. Enough. Are you willing to undergo this mission, Drogoth? Hmm. Well. <clears throat> well, you had me at killing bugs. Show me how to use Aegis and I'll get it done. Excellent. He claps his hand as if seeing the circus for the first time. I love the way that the short-lived are willing to die even faster. It's very inspirational. Brockus raises his hand and Harlequin's clapping instantly stops. There is one final note. A warning, if you will. You have seen the danger the insects represent, but you have not witnessed the shaman's power. The shaman must tap into a powerful source of magic in order to summon a queen. We do not know what abilities that power source will grant. Beware of the insects, but do not underestimate the shaman. Hey, don't scare the kid, Hansel. We still need him to go on the mission. By the by, I'm coming with you, Dralgoth. I wouldn't mind seeing these creatures for myself. I missed them last time. Telestrian will bankroll you so you can hire the rest of the team. 
Ooh, we got monies? Find me when you're ready to go and we'll bug right out of here. Oh, horrible pun. <laughs> Telestrian size. Yes, speak with Harlequin when you're ready to depart. If you wish to acquire additional supplies for your mission, find my assistant, Quoth. He is highly resourceful. Interesting. We got Karma 8. How much karma do we have? Okay, we have 8. And 15,785. So, let's go ahead and... Well, I guess let's uh, increase our close combat. Which gives us a one available karma. And we can't... Okay, we can talk to other people. That's good. First things first. Let's uh, talk to Quoth. Was he down here originally? I'm going to have to find him. Quoth! I have need of you. I need the gears, sir. The sweet, sweet gears. In addition to the Aegis loaded launchers we will provide, I am authorized to outfit you with anything from weapons to supply to clothing. I didn't do the butler voice, I apologize. Uh, let's see the gear. Okay, we've got the Thunderbolt. I think we have most of this stuff already. Yeah, the Dragon Sword. Hmm. What do we have in our equipment? Ooh, we need some, uh... We need some health packs and... Yeah, consumables. Okay, we've got grenades. That's fine. That's not what I'm needing. I am needing a Dock Wagon Platinum Trauma Kit and two premium med kits. We'll confirm that. And actually, can you... Let's talk to again. Can you... Uh... Do you have any drugs? Do you have any jazz or various... Nope, just straight, uh, good, st well, we'll come back to that. Let's look at the outfit, see if there was anything. No, we've already got max, max armor, which is good. I, I am not arguing with that at all. All right, let me see what you have in terms of cyberware. And the Universal Omnitech Cyberleg Alpha. That's the only real upgrade I can get. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and confirm. Now I am fully alphaed out on my cyber gear. I can't get much better than this. So I am going to go ahead and get one more really good med pack, allegedly. Where are you? Premium med kit and confirm. And if that doesn't take care of it, nothing will. Thank you, Mr. Quoth. Now let's go ahead and talk to some of these people in here before we head out onto the, uh, with Harlequin there. Let's talk to, uh, Algernon. May I provide spells, spirit foci, or fetishes to help you on this critical quest? I have questions first. Uh, speak it. Were you spying on me at the Seamstress's Union? His eyes widen at the question. You mis mistake your importance, Strogoth. No, I was not spying on you. Until Mr. Telestrian summons, you were beneath my notice. I only saw a customer. Now, do you require my magic? Well, are you... Or who are you? I'm a peddler of magical spells, spirits, and foci. Nothing more. Nothing else? No. Do you require my magic? Are you really here? Algernon's face takes on a dreamy expression. Are any of us? Yes, Drogoth, I am here. And at the Seamstress's Union and a myriad of other places. On to the work at hand. Do you require my magic? Well, let's see what he's selling. I, there's nothing that's really going to... Yeah, there's nothing that I can get from him. So that was... Speak to Quoth to purchase supplies, which I did. And... Now let's talk to Hans. We did not allow many opportunities during our briefing for you to ask questions, Shadowrunner. You may ask them now. 
Now, how did the inspe insect spirits get here, Hans? When the membrane between planes thins, the insect spirits reach into the mind of a shaman and begin their manipulation, playing on weaknesses and offering unlimited power, if the rituals needed to bring the spirits here are performed. But once a shaman takes on an insect spirit as a totem, they begin an inevitable decline into insanity, slowly losing their humanity. Eventually, the shaman completely succumbs, choosing the contentment and sense of clear purpose that being part of a hive provides. Perform your role, serve your queen, that is all. Hmm. Well, I really don't need any more... I mean, that's... What he's telling me is pretty cut and dry, I think. And I don't think I can talk to Telestrian again unless he's back here. Oh, yes we can. Hello, James. Is there something I can clarify for you? Yeah, actually, why was Marie Louise taken by the Universal Brotherhood? He pauses before answering. The host for the Queen is chosen very carefully as the interactions between the Queen and Lead Shaman are critical. A family connection between the two roles is ideal. As you have discovered my father's indiscretion with Melinda Watts, you know that Jessica Watts, the Shaman, and Marie Louise are related by blood. I would appreciate it if that information remains in the shadows. Okay. That makes sense. So we do have to take on Jessica, who's probably going to be a really nasty customer. And finally, let's talk to Marie Louise. I was listening. It sounds bad. Yep. Thank you for everything. Yeah, piece of cake. I don't think so, but thanks for the reassurance. You look like you have a question. Hmm. Well... What did Harkeem tell you about us breaking into your father's office? Nothing. I haven't spoken to him since last night. Why? What happened? Ugh. We went in hard and fast. It got bloody. What? No, that wasn't supposed to happen. I thought you were... He told me... Oh no. She closes her eyes tightly. Oh no. Well, I'm sorry. That's them's the breaks. Was it Harkeem who helped you in the Matrix? She smiles, in love. Yes, even after my father ruined his life and convinced me to hate him, he's still been watching over me, my angel in cyberspace, Baron Samedi. After we escaped, I told Har Harkeem about the Universal Brotherhood and about the bugs. It was his idea to steal Project Aegis so you could go back into the Universal Brotherhood and exterminate the bugs. But I don't know how he knew about it. Baron Samedi just knows things. Fair enough. Well, that looks like everyone I really need to talk to. We've got our gear. And we can't go upstairs, still. It looks like we'll be running with Harley Quinn, uh, basically to go try Aegis out. But I'll go in and go ahead and end the episode here guys i hope you've enjoyed it if you liked the episode go ahead and click like down below subscribe to the channel or leave a comment that'd be a big help and i'll see you next time later days everyone